And so this morning we're talking about a different subject. Yeah. That, but it, it's closely connected. It's a pain? Pain. Yeah, repentance is what we're talking about this morning. <laughs> and the power of repentance to shape our life. Like Bruce was talking about that idea of pain and pain avoidance. If, if your idea of a good life is just to avoid pain, then discipleship's out the window. Mm-hmm. There, there's not going to be any discipleship in your life because you're not going to push into anything hard. And, and repentance is very much in that camp. If, if you're just like, oh, no, I'm kind of repentance averse, you know, I, I don't know, I grew up in a culture where it was just, there was all the time, repent, repent, or, or a hellfire and brimstone, and you've just kind of laid that aside, then discipleship's out the window, because this is a, a major part of our spiritual formation. And, and not just the door in. It's, it's not just the door into the kingdom. It is a regular part of our life. And now you might be rightly asking yourself right now, Come on, guys, it's the Advent season. (laughs) Joy to the world, right? Do we have to talk about repentance? Uh, But you'd be surprised the connection. Let's pray real quick as we start. (laughs) Father, we pause this morning. And whether we've been in the kingdom and church our entire lives or whether we just got here today, we ask you, the God of the universe, to take this, this few minutes and that you would drop in our hearts and our minds something as we talk about this word of change that would change our, the course of our lives, mm-hmm. the, the course of our marriages, our families, even those even right now who are in the midst of decision, what do I do with this God that they talk about? What do I do with the God that I've trusted and seems to have let me down? What do I do with maybe the mess that I find myself in? What do I do with the wealth, maybe, that I find myself with? I believe you can catch us anywhere we live. And so we just submit to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, does anybody, uh, when we were kids, my mom always used to buy those advent calendars, you know? Mm -hmm. Remember, with the little doors, little cardboard? And you look in there, and there's like a mouse or something. Santa's in another one. I don't know, Christmas tree and another one. As you count down to Christmas every day, you know, you just can't wait. My, I always wanted to open the whole, all 30 of them, you know, when she bought it. And then she would say, no, you have to open them one at a time. And so you'd always be excited. To, but every door you opened was a countdown to Christmas, right? And it's the Advent season. And Advent means coming or waiting. So the entire concept of Advent is this idea of waiting. But it's interesting because... The, the keynote figure for Advent in the Bible is actually a guy named John the Baptist because he was on the scene and he was saying, hey, there's someone coming and I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. So he was the prophet of coming, but I've never seen John the Baptist in an Advent calendar. You know what I mean? You like open the little door and there's this guy in camel hair and grasshoppers saying, repent, you brood of vipers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, and so, but what, what is this thing with coming and waiting? You know who he was, he was talking to when he said that Brood of Vipers piece? Because his, his message was repent to everybody. Yeah. And he wasn't in the city, he was out in the countryside. People were coming to hear a message of repentance. They were flocking to this, mm. or this thing that was happening. And, and they were doing this thing where they, they're getting baptized. They're, they're simulating their own death. Like, what is happening out here in the countryside? What is this guy eating? What's he on? And, and so finally, the Pharisees send a, a group of people out. Look, go, go find out about this John the Baptist guy. And when he shows up, he speaks right to them. And he says, who told you guys to come and repent, you snakes? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that, isn't that how you grow a church? <laughs> right? If someone greets you at the door just as you walk, hey, Viper, <laughs> good to see you. Who told you to come here? <laughs> that, this is like just the opposite of all church growth, you know, things you're supposed to do. But there must be something that's happening because it was so attractive that many people were leaving the city, going out into the wilderness to find this guy and to hear this message. And then what happens when he, he finally points to someone who he's known all of it, actually his whole life, but somehow it, it clicked in, in a moment when he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Jesus himself at the beginning of his ministry, what's the beginning of his message? What's the first thing he says? From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent, 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In all the series, the last 11 weeks, or last 10 weeks, this is week 11, we've talked about all kinds of things that shape your faith. I honestly believe the reason we left this to the last is because without this one, none of the others will engage. You can do all kinds of things that affect you superficially, and that's not unimportant, Mm. but what repentance does is it changes you at the core level. If we don't change at the core, it's kind of like everything else or many other things in life. Um, We have all kinds of mechanisms in our culture to help change our behavior. Let's just take our relationship with food, for example. Um, We can hire health coaches that can show us data and show us different programs that get us to eat less calories, eat more fiber, eat more protein, eat less, whatever, eat more, I don't know, whatever the program is. But all those things will always be temporary unless we change the way we think about food. Because for many people, food is not just food, it is connected to other things like comfort or boredom or you know what I'm talking about right now. See, and so mm. what, those, what I'm describing here is, an, is a form of repentance, of a change. The word repentance means metanoia, means to change the way you think. It doesn't necessarily mean to change the way you act. That's the fruit of repentance. Repentance is to change the way I think about a particular thing. And in this case, we're talking about the way we think about ourselves and about God. Why is that important? Think about it, if we didn't need a savior, we wouldn't need Christmas. If we didn't need a savior, we wouldn't have needed a Christmas. We wouldn't have needed it. The fact that Christmas is significant is because we as human beings acknowledge the earth is a mess, and I'm included myself in that, Lord, so come, come, oh come, Emmanuel. So to get to what I think real repentance is, first we got to maybe say what repentance is not. There's a few things repentance is not that I think maybe have gotten stuck in our head. Because even when I say the word repent, you you might very well just jump to a visual of a guy on a street corner with a sign that's ready to bash you over the head and say the end is near. Uh, And he might not be wrong, just to say. Uh, (laughs) Jerry out of Shemekada. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Just kidding. Uh, but th- I think there might be some, some things in there even of, of why we do it, what it looks like that could very well be false. Th- and that was true of myself, at least, I can say that. And that is uh, the, the reason for repentance is not purely religious reasons. This, it, in other words, I can't do repentance in order to get what I want. Here's, here's why I say that. Uh, it's really easy to fall into this trap where where God becomes a means to an end instead of the end. And, and we, can even, we can even share the gospel in a way that appeals to people's selfishness so much that we've, we've not converted them at all. They, they started a humanist and they, they continued with the humanist. They're just using God to get the things that they want to do. Well, if I repent, then I will, in other words, we can present the gospel and say, hey, well, you want a better life, don't you? You want some of those feelings of guilt to go away, and, and you certainly don't want to burn in an eternal hell, and, and you, know, you want your relationships to go better, so you need you some Jesus. And we've pre- presented the, the Savior of the universe and the, the King of everything as some sort of a helper to make your life a little bit smoother. The same way we would sell someone shocks for their car and say, well, if you want a smoother ride, you should put these on there. And, and people have added Jesus to their life and repented in such a way that really nothing, like Bruce was saying, nothing at the bottom of their life has changed. Their joys still come from the exact same things. Jesus hasn't yet transformed them into, into anything different because they've, they've used Jesus as a means to get their ends. This is the consumer package that I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier that's been infiltrated into the church by our culture. And I understand our culture. Our culture being a consumer culture makes perfect sense. That's what makes capitalism go round, right? We don't shop because we need things all the time. We shop because we shop, right? And again, it's our relationship with stuff similar to the relationship with food. But what happens is, is when that gets mixed in with the gospel is Jesus is seen as the ultimate Costco in experience, right? Free samples, membership, and has privileges, and there's always something new. And so there's this idea 
the, around our culture today, you hear, we've heard it a lot of this, this falling away, these people drifting from their faith, these people, uh, they can't do Jesus anymore, they can't do church, and there's, there's some validity there, but I believe a lot of that is rooted in this deep disappointment with God, because God has not acted the way I think or thought he would act. Yeah. I want to say that again. When I have an idea of how God should act, really what I've done is I've inadvertently slipped into a consumer Christianity because I'm in charge and God is that guy who's here to do my bidding. And when he doesn't do things in the way of tragedy or provision or marriage or whatever, the way I think, I'm disappointed. Hmm. And then I just begin to drift. I'm disillusioned. And I want to suggest to you that at that moment, I have things 180 degrees backwards in my relationship with God. Philip Yancey wrote a great book. I'd, I'd recommend it called Disappointment with yeah. God. And, and it's funny. I felt like maybe it was a betrayal just to read it. I'm like, oh, should I even, can I even say that? To just even say that anything about my relationship with God has been disappointing? But when I read it, I realized, oh, no, there's lots of things in my relationship with God that have been disappointing. And it's almost always because I was expecting him to do something for me, right? In other words, who was the Lord in that relationship? Mm -hmm. I was the Lord. I was Lord. I was really disappointed in the service that I got from him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you come into the kingdom that way in this weird backwards repentance, then you're going to find yourself at some point disappointed with the service and, and ready to walk away. Now, another thing that... that Repentance is not. Repentance is not um, a, a new form of self-righteousness. In other words, if, if I just, if I punish myself enough through repentance, if I self-flagellate, if I just whip myself and, and, and really, really cry and show enough, uh, enough sorrow, then I've paid for the wrong thing that I've done. The way to pay for it is to just to show a whole lot of sorrow. Uh, that's not that's not repentance. That's just another form of trying to, to balance a scale. That's religion, and, and you'll never be sorry enough. You won't. Mm. If, if we could be righteous, we would. Someone else would have done it, but none of us ever have. And I often see this sometimes um, in relationships, uh, in, in a counseling situation. Um, uh, a, a couple who, one, of, one or the other, has wronged the other repeatedly and done it time and time again. And finally, uh, say the wife leaves and says, I'm, I'm done, I'm not coming back. And then he shows an amazing amount of repentance. I'm so sorry, I finally see it. I can't believe I ever behaved this way. I, you, you have been right all along and I have been wrong all along. Pastor, please get her back here. Mm. And, and, and we talk and, and she's impressed by the, the repentance. Seems like he really gets it. I've never seen this in him before. And she's back. But then... All he was really sorry for is what it cost him. He's sorry that she left. He's not sorry for his behavior. So eventually he slips back into the same behavior. And that, that, that self-righteous repentance didn't take. It doesn't keep. It, it may seem impressive to someone who we've wronged, but it's never enough. And, and that's not real repentance. That's not gospel repentance. It's not fear-based. Um, what it is, is it's driven by something else. Just like, again, this core value thing, we, our relationship with food or whatever, it's not fear-based. If it is, then there's always going to be some other greater fear that's going to have my attention. Oftentimes, if it's fear-based, it's still me-based. It's still about me at the core. Just like the illustration of driving down the road and seeing that that motorcycle on the side of the road and the guy in the uniform has what looks like a gun in his hand, but you realize it's a radar machine. All of a sudden, your entire behavior has changed. Mm -hmm. If you were to take your blood pressure, it's racing and mm -hmm. you've become righteous and holy and, and humble and, mm -hmm. and he pulls you over and you just, you're just the meekest person on the face of the earth. Like instantaneously, mm -hmm. you have been transformed. Who cannot relate to that miracle, right? That <laughs> side of the road miracle. I believe, I believe, I believe, right? And you are, really, isn't that, it's just shocking, but if you stop and just think, it's all rooted in fear. 
of what I stand to lose in this moment. And my life is in this, this officer's hand, right? There's this fear of man that overcomes us. And somehow there's a better way. There's got to be. Mm. That is just, I beg you this morning, that's not the God of the universe. Mm. There's got to be a better way. There's a place for, for reverence and awe and, and the fear of the Lord, but, mm. but that cannot be our daily bread. And I just want to say, too, that uh, that's also the way a lot of us start. Uh, unfortunately, that, that is the way a lot of us start. And, and you know that. You've hit some, some roadblock, something, and you're like, oh, God, I'm sorry. How could I have gotten myself in this situation? And, and C.S. Lewis says it's a good thing that God is humble or else he wouldn't take us for the reasons that we come to him. <laughs> and I find that to be so true in my life. But I'm, you know what, though? We don't have to stay there. We don't have to continue to live in that cycle of, of caught, feel bad, caught, feel bad. There's, there's a whole nother gospel way that's completely different. And that's what we want to talk about now because there's, there, there's so many examples of this in Scripture. But we want to look at Luke 19, starting at verse 1, because there's amazing interaction that Jesus has with a tax collector. And we probably, most of us were first introduced to it, at least if you're my age, in the form of a Sunday school song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. You remember this song? A wee little man was he. Climbed up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. I love that song. It's a great song. So, were you looking at me? I didn't even, I didn't even <laughs> pretend to look at you. And... <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, don't look at me now because it's no... So, Luke 19... Why don't you read it? <laughs> I just felt like you were looking at me. I was not looking at you. <laughs> Full disclosure, I wrote the sermon this Sunday. <laughs> you picked this. He might have picked something else. <laughs> he entered into Jericho, he being Jesus, and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Just, just stop here for just a second. I love this about Jesus. He invites himself to dinner. <laughs> It's honestly, it's one of my favorite things about Jesus. He's constantly telling people, I'm going to go to your house. You're going to feed me. Mm. But also, just pay attention to what's happening here. Someone who, who would be used to ridicule, tax collector, the worst of the worst. There's a whole category of sinners just called tax collectors. Mm -hmm. and, and he puts himself in a position to be ridiculed again. And, and Jesus does not rebuke him. The word repent is not in here. Instead, he invites him into something. Right? He's inviting himself to his house, but he's also inviting him into his presence, into the kingdom. So Zacchaeus hurry up and come down. He goes to his house. He says, uh, he's gone. And the people freak out. When they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone to be a guest at a man's house who's a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he's also a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. What happened here? Repentance. True, deep gospel repentance took place. Something completely changed about this tax collector's life. Pay attention here to what, he's, what he did because it sounds like he probably just gave away everything. Half of it was just gonna be given away. I'm just gonna take half of what I have and I'm gonna give it away. The rest... I'm going to use restitution and I'm going to give back to everybody that I've ever stolen from four times over. So does that sound like he's looking to get something out of Jesus? No, something else took place. He realized he was being offered something more valuable than everything that he owned and that he would be crazy to hang on to all of his belongings, to hang on to his stature, to hang on to his position, to hang on to the power that his position gave him. And instead, he laid it all down at the feet of Jesus and said, it all belongs to you. 
because you are worthy, as we sang, you are worthy of it all. That's what repentance looks like. And it's interesting, don't miss the, the phrase there that I love. He says, he hurried down and received him joyfully. Zacchaeus didn't have any dread. He knew, Zacchaeus knew exactly who he was dealing with. The word had been out. This is well along in the gospel when this takes place. So Zacchaeus the, knew who he was dealing with. And yet, there was something about this invitation. I'm going to dine with you, Zacchaeus. This, this unmerited favor that we call grace that spurred something in Zacchaeus' heart called joy that led to a change of behavior. Please don't miss the sequence. Zacchaeus responded to the invitation and something was born in his heart called joy that in turn then affected his behavior. I think the reason sometimes we can't wrap our minds around it is we reverse this process. We see God as a miser. We see God as, a, as, a, as some kind of a, a judge who just wants to make our life miserable. So then we try to figure out what we can give up or what we can, we can let go of so that he would love us and bless us. And we do it grudgingly and grumbling. And we've got it again, 180 degrees backwards. We, Zacchaeus started with who was inviting him. Somehow that joy blossomed in his heart and then his behavior just followed suit. So there was something internal going on inside yeah. of Zacchaeus there. And it started with the revelation of God's value. We talked about this earlier in the series. It always starts with the revelation of God's value. But then there has to be a, a step of application. From finding out something true, it's not enough to just hold it as true. If he just said, oh, you really are the Messiah, and nothing about his life had changed, you'd say, well, there's no fruit of repentance here. He's, he's verbalizing something, but, but nothing's really taking place. So how do we go past just a revelation, just being able to sing the song, he is worthy of it all, to really giving him our whole life as an act of repentance in, in, as a fruit of repentance? And the first thing, the first step we want to talk about is you have to actually be brave enough to take a look at yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say brave because there is a whole industry around avoiding this. You have been sold so many distractions so you don't have to be alone with yourself. So you don't have to think about the state of your soul. So you don't have to ever feel convicted about anything that you've done. Trust me, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And, and there's a lot going against you right now to just take the time to be quiet and to listen to the Holy Spirit. And the other yeah. thing, the part of this is, is you have to hear from other people around you. Now, you think being alone with yourself and honest with yourself is hard. Try walking up to someone who really knows you and saying, hey, well, what, do, what do people really think about me? <laughs> That's scary, isn't it? Because you're afraid they're going to tell you the truth. But it's also integral to this, this ability to actually be able to move to a place of real gospel repentance. Paul would say in Romans, you know, I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but, darn it, I don't have the ability to carry it out. For that I do not do the good that I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do is what I keep on doing. You need to hear the teeth grinding. <laughs> now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And here is this, here's this core issue, this thing we're fighting with is not just a poor self-image or a bad upbringing or things like that, but it's at its core, what we're repenting of is, is this thing the Bible calls sin, this, this, um, this inward sort of uh, attitude, this heart-shaped attitude towards God that call, the Bible calls rebellion. Uh I might get in trouble here. I don't know. But Trisha came home from uh, shopping the other day and she was at a, at a place. She said this, this random stranger just started a conversation with her and she just moved into town and she just told her whole, whole life story while, you know, looking through racks of clothes. And, and the lady said, I have two kids. One of them is diagnosed with uh, oppositional defiance disorder. And Trisha had never heard of that. She's like, oppositional defiance disorder. Is that like Adamic nature? What is that? Because <laughs> like, we're all oppositionally defiant. I'm not saying there isn't a real disorder. I don't know anything about it. I'm saying we're all born 
with this mm. sin internal to us. And that's why it's not enough to just examine ourselves because sin is inside of us and sin is hidden by the sinner. And listen to this. We have to have that. Oh, uh, in years past, people used to call it accountability partner. Mm. It's just someone who's across from you who sees you and is honest with you. Uh, I call it Trisha. <laughs> <laughs> I highly recommend finding one. <laughs> Genesis 4. But isn't that amazing? Yeah, he's joking, but there's, isn't it interesting that God gave us two incredible institutions to help us with this? We're not alone. One is, one is marriage relationship because no one sees us clearer than that one who is closest to us. And two is Christian community. When you're genuinely connected to other people in relationship and you're genuinely connected to community, it's almost as if God has brought these mirrors into our lives, not to shame us, but to shape us. Mm -hmm. That's why the gospel is so powerful when it's lived out in community. You want to hear who had the best mirror ever? Uh, it was a guy named Cain. In Genesis chapter 4, mm. remember Cain and Abel, they, they both offer a sacrifice Abel's is acceptable, and something about Cain, something about his heart, his, his sacrifice wasn't acceptable. So the best accountability partner in the universe, God, stepped in and said, hey, I see something in you. You should pay attention to that. And this is what it sounded like. He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. I love this word picture. Listen, sin is crouching at the door. What does that mean? Have you ever seen a predator? We've all watched those shows, right? Predator sneaking up on, and it's down on its belly, and it's just, what's it, you know, I, every time I have this internal monologue that I can hear it going, I'm just an antelope like you. Don't pay any attention to me. No, I'm just a little bit of grass moving through here. I'm not doing anything. Sin hides inside of us, and it lies to us. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little attitude. I'm no big deal. You don't have to pay any attention to me. I'm not going to hurt you. This will never come back to bite you. Mm. <laughs> Sin is hidden from us. We need an accountability partner. God was speaking to, to his son saying, listen, son, pay attention. That thing that you think is little, that thing that's just hidden down there, it wants to destroy you. You have to master it. Sin is predatory. It's a mistake to live with a predator. I, I go for walks sometimes on my day off. I try to find parks where nobody's at. There's one over here that I don't want to tell you about. It's really cool. <laughs> and, and, and it was founded by these pioneers and there's this whole plaque about you know, why it's there and everything. It's really cool. I was reading the plaque and then right beside the plaque is cougar warning. There was a cougar spotted here yesterday. And I thought, do I want to go walking here first? And then I thought, those pioneers would have never put up with that. They'd have killed that cougar because <laughs> they know it's us or them. That cougar's going to eat my sheep or my kids, and I'm not going to let it live. Now, we live in a different world, and maybe we should have some cougars around, but you should not allow sin to be in your life. <laughs> it wants to eat you. Isn't it amazing the move on today of all the people that want to be friends with wild animals? Like, I just have this thing with grizzly bears. They, they understand me. <laughs> and so I'm going to move up into the wild of the Yukon, and I'm gonna, you know, we're going we're gonna to commune together, the grizzly bear. And it's funny because the Don't grizzly bear... Don't make fun bear, of my family. It's nice. yeah, <laughs> The grizzly bear kind of puts up with that for a while, and then one day just eats you. Yeah. Just like, ha ha, I, I'm a grizzly bear, and you're food. I mean, how many have seen that kind of a thing, right? People get killed playing with predators. <laughs> yeah, we're going there, guys. Yeah, yeah. But this thing of deception, it's a sneaky thing, like Jason is saying, because it kind of sounds like this. Well, I'm not really stingy. I'm just prudent. Or I'm not irritable. I'm, I'm just, um, I'm firstborn. <laughs> I'm type A. I'm not mean. I just, I just say it like it is. Yeah. I'm not ju judgmental. I'm, I'm discerning. Mm -hmm. Right? You need a friend to say, you're judgmental. Yeah. You're mean. You're, you, that's a real friend. That's, that's, a, that's a good marriage relationship. Oh, my God. I'm not obsessed with, with my physical appearance. I'm just, I'm just a good groomer. I, I pick this <laughs> up. I mean, it goes on and on and on. John Owen, a Puritan, said this. 
a Puritan theologian. He says, do you mortify? Do you, do, you, do you make it your daily work? Be always at it while you're alive. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Huh. I, don't, I don't know that we've embraced our walk of repentance like that. I don't know if we've taken seriously the, the, the little sins in our life. And oftentimes we find out, oh, that was a crouching tiger. <laughs> uh, that was a lot bigger than I, I really thought it was. And it, it ate my lunch and it hurt my marriage and it's, it's hurt my life. And most importantly though, listen, isn't what sin does to you, although it'll kill you, it's what it does to our savior. Because he actually took our sin upon himself. The, mm -hmm. the, the truth is, he is just in giving us grace because he took our sin upon himself and paid the price. Why would we step back into that prison cell when the door has been flung wide open? We walk back in because we still find, for some reason, we still find joy in those things because the, the place of our joys has not yet been been changed. And, and that's the thing I think we, we got to end with here is we've got to learn to convict ourselves with our joys. Mm -hmm. We have to mm -hmm. learn to convict ourselves with our joys and find our joys in Jesus. And that's going to take a process. The same way as Bruce started this by talking about food, because it's, it's a great way to example, be an example of this, because right now, you know, pizza may still just, it's delicious. Come on. It's, it's killing me, but it's delicious. It feels like my friend when I'm depressed. <laughs> yeah. But you've got to find joy in, in higher, better things. Mm -hmm. And what might feel right now in reading through the Bible, just like eating plain oatmeal. Like, mm -hmm. You've got to press in and you will find a joy in that. You're like, why would I read anything else? But you've got to push through a certain amount of pain to get there. A worship team can come up. We'll finish them. Yeah. Um, you know, I said at the beginning, our culture is disappointed mm -hmm. with God. Fortunately, they're disappointed with everything. <laughs> disappointed with politics and political parties. Disappointed with economics. Disappointed with just about everything. Because it's the spirit of our culture. <sighs> Somehow, and there's this treasure that God has promised to be who he's always promised to be. And every person on the planet in every generation has the invitation, just like Zacchaeus had, to tap into that joy. But there is nothing I could say, there's nothing Pastor Jason and I could ever say to talk you into it. It's got to be something that you begin to search for. And you begin to search for it by eliminating the competition. Like he said, there's a multi-billion dollar industry out there that competes with this search for joy. So we have to turn and face ourselves and say, first of all, God, listen, it's me. John would say, the writer John in his epistle would say, you know, if we say we have no sin, if we say we have no misguided, no, 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? This, uh, this, this misconstrued concept of joy this perverted, twisted sense of value, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say, not me, we make him out to be a liar and his word cannot dwell in us. It's a remarkable statement because John is preempting. He's saying, no, no, there's already someone who's given their life to invite you down from the tree and to communion with him. He's already taken the first step. We're not talking, trying to talk God into something. The gospel message is he made the first move. That's what Christmas is about. The culmination of God's plan that I'm going to make the first move. I'll move towards injustice. I'll move towards disappointment. I'll move towards discomfort. I'll move towards laying my life down for you first mm -hmm. so that something would be sparked in you to reciprocate and have me for dinner. Mm -hmm. You've heard us say before the, the implications of the gospel in its simplest form are that we're 
much more sinful, much more flawed than we ever dared really look at in our own life, but we're also much more deeply loved and accepted and forgiven than we ever dared dreamed. Um, as we close here with uh, worship, I wanna invite you to that place of forgiveness. And it starts with us moving towards him. So communion is here in the front and in the back of the, the room. So I invite you to come and, and take, uh, take of communion at the end of the song. If you'll hold on to it, we'll all partake together.